Trinadapi Sunichena Toradiva Sahishnuna Amanina Manadena Kirtaniya Harenama 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 Iva Kevalam Klo Nasyeva 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 Gatir Anyata so we are continuing our seminar on the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Bhagavad Gita is also known as Gita Upanishad or Gita Upanishad. We already studied five chapters. Tonight we will do the first half of chapter six. Chapter six is entitled Dhyana Yoga. Let's review what we've learned in the first five chapters. In the first chapter, Arjuna asked Krishna to show him who would be there on the battlefield, who he had to fight. Can you put one on the art? Yes, thank you. He wanted to see who came. There was the assessment by Duryodhan of his side and there was the assessment of the Pandava's side. Also in chapter 1, something happened to the Kauravas that did not happen to the Pandavas. When the Kauravas blew their conch shells, it had no effect on the Pandavas. But when Krishna and the Pandavas blew their conch shells, it had an effect on the Kauravas. And in the very first verse, it is mentioned that because this battle was performed at Kurukshetra, which was a holy place, that was looking good for the Pandavas. It was not looking good for the Kauravas. In chapter 1, when Arjuna sees who he has to fight, he becomes bewildered, he becomes morose, he becomes confused, and he begins to give arguments why he does not want to fight this war. He gives arguments based on morality, he gives arguments based on tradition, and at the end of chapter 1, Arjuna tells Krishna, I shall not fight. Chapter 2 begins with Krishna telling Arjuna, you are sounding as if you are a pundit, a learned man. But actually, no learned man talks like you are talking now. It was a mild chastisement. Arjuna gave some more arguments why he did not want to fight. But then, the turning point of Bhagavad Gita. Who can tell me what is the turning point of what's that? That's not the turning point of Bhagavad Gita. Yes, that's the turning point. When he says, I'm confused, I don't know what I should do, but I'm surrendering to you. Now I am your Shishya, your disciple. You instruct me. That's the turning point. Because Krishna was not going to do anything except drive the chariot. As in chapter 1, Arjuna gave the instruction, Take me, I want to see. Krishna said, Okay, behold, here's the Kauravas. But this turning point is when Arjuna says to Krishna, no more friendly talks. 
your guru. You instruct me. Though Krishna believes in the philosophy, don't ask, don't tell. If you want Krishna, then he will instruct. You don't want Krishna, then Krishna will not interfere. Krishna is sitting where in the body? In the heart. And he's doing several things. He's overseeing and permitting, sanctioning, witnessing. He's also doing three other things. What are the other three things, my dear Hiran, that Super Soul is doing? He's doing three other things. What? And what else? You said that. Forgetfulness, remembrance, and? Yes, knowledge or intelligence or understanding. These are the three things. Matak, smritir, jnanam, apohanam. So these are the functions of super soul. Super soul would like to give instructions, but you have to indicate, yes. Otherwise, it was Krishna telling Hiranyakashipu how to be big, big demon. He was not doing it independently. Krishna was telling, oh, you want to be a demon? Here's how you do. And it was Krishna in the heart of Prahlad telling him how to be bhakta, how to be a devotee. Krishna plays both sides. He's neutral, udasina. All right, so Meenakshi already answered, but... What is the first lesson of Bhagavad Gita? And not the... Not the... My, not the soul. Not the body and also not what else? The mind. Because you will see many people, they think mind is the soul. I met people like this. My brother my eldest brother, he thinks the mind is the real thing. He doesn't believe in soul. He believes the mind is, but we're going to learn about the mind in today's lesson. So, you're not the body, you're not your mind, you are spirit soul. And in chapter 2, various symptoms of the soul were given, such as Nobody knows the symptoms of the soul? How about English? Cannot be cut. It is eternal. Cannot be dried. Can you see it? Therefore, it's what? If you can't see something, it's invisible. Very good. Here's my thing. Good. Right. And the soul never had a... Yes. There's no birthday for the soul. It always existed. Always. Very good. Okay. 20 verses. Krishna explains the difference between the body and the soul. Now, in that first section of chapter 2, Something Krishna repeats to Arjuna many times. Do not... Ah, who said that? You've learned Bhagavad Gita. What's the Sanskrit line? Natvam sochitam arhasi. Arhasi means you do not deserve... You do not deserve to lament. And we learned in chapter 2 that what uh, uh, Krishna gave an analogy how to understand changing bodies. Change the clothes. Very good. 
Good. All right. At the conclusion of the 20 verses in chapter 2, where Krishna is explaining the difference between the body and the soul, his final statement in that section is, therefore, oh, yes. Stand up and fight. That is the conclusion. Okay, the next part of chapter 2, Krishna explains why Arjuna should fight based on his situation as a Kshatriya. So what was the win-win proposition Krishna gave Arjuna? Yeah, uh, 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 go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. If you win, what happens? No, no. If he wins, he gets the... He gets the kingdom. If he loses, he goes to heaven. That was the win-win. Because of Kshatriya, that's all he cares about. If I fight, I conquer, I rule, because this war was to determine who was going to rule the earth. That was the stakes. He would rule the earth. So if you fight and you win, sovereignty. You lose, you die, you're going to heaven. What's, either way, it's, it's a win-win situation. All right? Now, already in Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada has given three synonyms for bhakti. One is karma yoga one is buddhi yoga and then bhakti so the next section in chapter 2 is buddhi yoga jnana yoga no he doesn't say jnana yoga he says karma yoga uh, buddhi yoga and bhakti yoga he uses these interchange he does not say jnana yoga as the same as bhakti, but karma yoga and um, buddhi yoga. Okay, so if Krishna, in this section of buddhi yoga, the central theme is connecting to Krishna by means of intelligence. Very good. All right. Then Arjuna asks a question. The question was, what is the symptoms of a person whose consciousness is merged in transcendence? Because transcendence is beyond the material realm. That is what is meant by transcendence. Beyond the three modes of nature. The three modes of nature are? Goodness, passion, and ignorance. Very good. So beyond it is called now. I have a question. It's not here. Something I have mentioned so many times. There's a name for Krishna which means he is beyond the scope of the mind and senses to comprehend. Now I know who's my student. Very good. Everybody say Adhok Saja, beyond the mind and the senses. So now put on your thinking caps, okay? Because the next question is if Krishna is beyond the range of the senses, then what the hell are you guys doing? So what's the response? People will say if something is unattainable by the mind and senses, why are you wasting your time with your chanting and your work? What do you say in response to such an idiot? Yes. Although he's beyond the range of the senses, he will reveal himself, but you have to do what? What's that? Well, in a general sense. The process. Ah, 
devotional service. Another way you could answer is, he will reveal himself if you take to the process that he himself recommends. You can't make up your process. That's the, well, many people want to do that. Many people think like that. I will approach God in my way. You have your way, I have my way. But that's not what Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam teaches us. There, he will reveal himself if you follow his process. Now, according to Bhagavad Gita, his process is devotional service. Bhakti yoga, devotional. That's the process he recommends. Okay? At least three places. At the end, in chapter 8, he says that. He uses the word bhakti. At the end of chapter 11, second to the last verse, same thing. And then the famous verse in chapter 18. That if you want to see me, you want to know me, you want to understand me only by bhakti. In chapter 11, the way Prabhupada translates it, only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you. So that's why in chapter 18, he says, Mom A come. What is the significance of Mom A come? Only that word. Eka means me alone. Me. Okay, very good. Yes. Yes. Bhakti is the, all over that verse. Very good. Okay. So, next chapter, chapter 3. Now, chapter 3 is also similar to another chapter in Bhagavad Gita. Which chapter? What's that? Not chapter 13. It has practically the same title. We just studied it. Chapter 5. Chapter 3 is entitled Karma Yoga. And chapter 5 is entitled Karma Yoga, Action in Krishna Consciousness. Because that's the real definition of Karma Yoga, Action in Krishna Consciousness. So those two chapters go together. In chapter 4, what was the title of chapter 4? Transcendental Knowledge. Very good which was very interesting. Who did Krishna say was the original recipient of Bhagavad Gita? What is his position? Sun God. Sun God. So, according to what we learned in chapter 4, what is the system that Bhagavad Gita is introduced into human society? Cyclic succession, or the, what's the Sanskrit? Parampara, very good. So in the, one of the purports, Prabhupada said, so therefore we can understand Bhagavad Gita has been in human society at least two million years. Okay? So if anybody says about the Bible, about this, and that's okay. We go back at least two million years. All right? So you're not the only way. All right? And you don't have a monopoly on son of God. We have so many sons of God. Who is the son of God from Garbhodakshay Vishnu? Brahma. Lord Brahma. And we could also say everyone is son or daughter of God. Because Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am the seed giving father of all living entities. So we have the real understanding of God the Father. That's a concept in the Christian theology. God as the... We have that very clearly. Aham bija padap pita. There's the word. Pita. 
father. All right, in chapter 4, what was the key question Arjuna asked Krishna in chapter 4? It's a very important question. But that wasn't the question. That was the answer. No, 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 no. It's related to this. What was Arjuna's doubt? You gave the, the answer. Yes? There you go. Because Arjuna's looking at Krishna. Wait, you and I are contemporaries. It's just like, say, Rohan told uh, Hiran, Oh, I played basketball with Will Chamberlain. He's going to go, what? How is that possible? Right? So Arjuna's wondering how Krishna spoke Bhagavad. Now the answer was, you and I have had what? And what's the difference? Yes. So that statement by Krishna is a classic answer to distinguish the jiva from Ishwar or soul from God. Because the Mayavadis say the soul and God are equal or the same. But this verse in Bhagavad Gita is very clear. Krishna says, I can remember everything, not you. So there's a difference between the living entity and God. Very good. Now, after that, Krishna explains the reasons why he appears in this world. What are the reasons he appears? Ah, uh, kill the demons and do what? What did you do? Yes, give thanks. Okay, good. Establish religion. We already said that. By establishing religion, what else does he do? Be demons and what else? Yes, irreligion is wiped out. Because if you don't have religion, then you're going to have so many false philosophies and so many other things being propagated. But by, when Krishna comes, all other nonsense is driven out. Now, Krishna is here, he establishes. He kills the demons, protects the devotees. What festival did we just observe that is the classic example of Krishna killing the demons and protecting the devotees? Nasringa. Perfect, classic example. There it is. Prahlad, five-year-old boy, did he try to protect himself? No. What did he do? Right. So whenever Hiranyakashipu was torturing, what did Prahlad do? Remembering Krishna or chanting. He was doing devotional service. He wasn't trying to protect himself. He depended on Krishna. In this case, he appears as Lord Nisringa. Now the question comes. Why did the Lord appear in that particular form? Yes, because Lord Brahma gave so many benedictions to Hir What was Hiranyakashipu's original intention? But what did Brahma say? Why? Ah, you can't give something to somebody you don't have. Can't do that. Very good. So he had all these stipulations. So he had, the Lord had to appear in that particular form and kill him at this particular time. Exactly how it was done was just to keep. So when... After Hiranyakashipu was killed, after Prahlad offered his prayers, Lord Nisringa wanted to give a benediction. Okay, before Lord Nisringa went back, 
what did he tell Lord Brahma? Right. Don't give these kinds of benedictions again. Don't do this. All right? Now, when Lord Nisringa offered to give Prahlad benedictions, what did Prahlad say? Why? Ooh. I'm not doing business. Very good. That's the exact word Prabhupada uses. Vanik. Vanik, merchant. I'm not a merchant. I'm not doing business with you. I'm your servant. You're my master. That's all. But then, Lord Nisringa insisted. So what did Prahlad then say? What did he say then? Okay, that's a side benefit. What's that? Yeah, as I said, that's a side benefit. What was the initial response? Prahlad's, if you want to give me a benediction, do some, what? The father thing is a side benefit. No, 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 no. Something here. What? Pretty close. You're the closest one yet. No more material desires. I want no more material desires. Yes, the, his father, that was after that. But the initial main response is, if you must give me a benediction, no more material desires in my heart. Yes. Okay, now you interest, somebody introduced. So, Lord Nisringa promised what to Prahlad? That what? Twenty-one generations what? But what? But what? Deliver. Okay. But Lord Nisringa made a promise to Prahlad. Won't kill what? Right. And who Krishna could have killed, but because of this, was that? No, Krishna didn't fight Bali. No. Krishna. Krishna. Banasura. Was Banasura. Banasura had how many arms? How many did he leave him with? No. Four. Hey, read your Krishna book. Four. Very good. All right. All right, we'll stop here. Everybody chant Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya So as you can see, I've broken out this first part into sections. So the first four verses, the subject matter is renunciation. Please follow along. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, One who is unattached to the fruits of work and who works as is obligated is in the renounced order of life and is the true mystic, not one who lights no fire and performs no duty. So this verse is actually very revolutionary. That when, when it says works as obligated, that means either you're a Kshatriya, Brahmin, Shudra, Vaishya, because that's what it means to work as obligated. There are duties in Veda culture, everybody has duties. Even in the seventh canto, Narada Muni outlines the duties of a woman. 
So everyone has duties. So Krishna is saying here, even though you are doing your prescribed duties, that's another term, prescribed duties. You don't make up your prescribed duties. Prescribed duties means it's already prescribed in the scriptures. You can't make up your duties. Whether you're a Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, your duties are already outlined, what you should and should not do. Later in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says there's a kind of person who does not know what his duty is. What kind of person is that? Demon. A demon is somebody who does not know what is their duty according to the Vedas. So that's why at the end of chapter 16, Krishna says, therefore, you should know what is duty and what is not duty by the regulations of the scriptures. Next question. There are four Vedas, 18 Puranas, 108 Upanishads, Vedanta Sutra, Mahabharata, Ramayana. If you were going to recommend one book so that someone could know what is their duty, you would say Bhagavad Gita. Very good. Okay, so, if according to Krishna now, one who is unattached to the fruits of work, so that's the key, unattached to the fruits of work. In Arjuna's case, whether he wins or loses, that's how he's unattached. He's going to fight. So even Arjuna fighting on the battlefield, according to Krishna, is the true mystic. Because he's doing his prescribed duty, but he's not attached to the fruits of work. All right, let's go to... And then on the opposite, Krishna is condemning the Mayavadi who says the way to achieve liberation is to do nothing. That's the Mayavadi. The way, because the Mayavadi thinks I have become entangled because of so many duties and so many works. So he wrongly concludes the way to achieve liberation, don't do anything. But here Krishna is saying, no, no, that's not correct. Not one who lights no fire and performs no duty. That's not how you escape the bonds of material nature. Because what did we learn in chapter 3? We learned something. We learned that the soul is always active. Even you try, you're still active. At night, what's still active when you're sleeping? Yes, the mind is still active. So there's no question of stopping all activities. That's impossible. So you don't give up your prescribed duties. You do your prescribed duties, but you're unattached to the fruits of work. Let's continue. What is called renunciation, you should know to be the same as yoga or linking oneself with the Supreme. So there is a nice way to explain what is real yoga, linking with the Supreme. Therefore, for the impersonalist, what is the Supreme? What's that? I didn't hear what you're saying. Brahman. For the yogi, what is the Supreme? Paramatma. And for the devotee, and who's Bhagavan? Or Ram, or Nisringa, fine. But the person, Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead. Very good. So, what is yoga? Linking with the Supreme. So, there are different yogas. That's okay. The question is, is your yoga linking with the Supreme? That's the question to ask whether it's hot yoga or cold yoga the question is is your yoga linking with the supreme 
For one can never become a yogi unless one renounces the desire for sense gratification. Question, O oh students, what is wrong with sense gratification? Why does Krishna say to renounce it? What's wrong with it? Okay, wait, wait. It can never be fulfilled. Very good. What else? What's that? You get attached. What else? You get false ego. What else? Yes, you don't get liberation by sense gratification. If that was the case, Ravana would get liberation. Hiranyakashipu would get liberation. If you studied carefully the seventh canto, the whole section on Prahlad, it was described that Hiranyakashipu had all kinds of sense gratification at his disposal. And he was always bloodshot with drinking alcohol, wine. But what did it say? He was never happy. Same way with Ravana. Ravana had, besides his wives, he had a harem every night when, when uh, Hanuman shrunk himself, cat size, and was looking for Sita when he entered Lanka. And he finally came to Ravana's palace. Ravana was snoring because he had just had a big party. So all the women were scantily clad and everybody was, had become intoxicated. And so it's, it's explained that Ravana, he had so many women every night, but he had to have who? Sita. So he had so much, but no satisfaction. That's the problem with sense credit, as you correctly said. There's no end. The millionaire wants two. Right? You want more. I want six chapatis. I get six chapatis. I want seven. Right? When it comes to sense gratification, there's no satiation. So the yogi has to renounce the desire for sense gratification. What's the opposite of sense gratification? What, 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 what? Somebody said something. Yes! Krishna Kumar, come to the head of the class. Devotional service. That's the only choice. Either you're doing sense gratification or you're doing devotional service. Very simple. Vanilla or chocolate? Chocolate is devotional service and vanilla is sense gratification. That's it. Because what does Lord Chaitanya say? He says, uh, Krishna Bhakta Nishkam Atta Eva Shanta Mukti Mukti Siddhi Kami. So whether you're a sense enjoyer or a yogi or an impersonalist, you still have some lusty desire. The Krishna devotee, Shanta. Atta Eva Shanta. So you have to do devotional service. Excellent. Let's continue. For one who is a neophyte, what does the word neophyte mean? Rohan. Rohan. Nope. Hey, it's Rohan's turn. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. One who is a neophyte in the Eightfold Yoga System, work is said to be the means. And for one who was already elevated in yoga, cessation of all material activities is said to be the means. Tell me if this statement is true or false, O oh, wise students. Tell me if this is a true or false statement. One who is a neophyte in devotional service, work is said to be the means. But one who is elevated in devotional service, cessation of all activities is said to be the means. Is that a true 
or a false statement. False. Shaker. Why is it false? I got to explain. That was a good guess. Now you have to explain. <laughs> What was the false statement? What's that? You got to speak up. But I didn't say material activities. I said, and for one who is elevated in devotional service, cessation of all activities. Why is that a false statement? Yes, because devotional service means... Yeah, activities. But activities for who? Krishna. Krishna. That's the key. Because there are many people who think like that. That spiritual life means I've just no more active. No, it's true. They think like that. They think I am now advanced spiritualist because I don't do anything. No. Devotional service means devotional activities. Classic example, Ambarish, right? Was Ambarish advanced? Yes, he was he defeated Durvasa Muni. But what, what's the description of Ambarish? He was going to the temple, he was bowing down, he was worshiping, smelling the flower, the incense, um, sometimes rubbing against the devotee. He was doing all of his senses were engaged. Shukadeva Goswami, what was his main service? Speaking. Seven days, seven nights. Okay? What was Parikshit's service? Hearing. And if you'll notice in Bhagavatam, he says, Parikshit says, others may get tired, not me. I am getting more and more enthusiasm by hearing from you, Shukadeva. All right, Prahlad. How did he achieve perfection? Yes, what does that mean? Yes, through all the tribulations, he simply remembered Krishna. Lakshmi, what did she do? What's that? What does that mean? Yes, where is Lakshmi's rightful position? At the chest, isn't she there? Sri Vatsa? Isn't that her? But she volunteered. Why does Lakshmi go down to Vishnu's feet? Why? She wants something. No, 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 no. That's not why she went down to the feet. No, she wants something. Why? No, that you got it. She wants that nectar that the devotees get. The devotees are not on the chest of Narayan. Where are the devotees? The feet. So Lakshmi is thinking, I want that nectar. How come I can't? So even though she's on the chest, she thinks, wait a second. I want the same nectar as you guys get. So she goes to Vishnu's feet. All right. How did Hanuman perfect himself? What does that mean? Who, what did he do? What was his first service? Find Sita. Then after that? Okay, after that? Yes, he's one of the big fighters against Ravan. Good. All right. Oh. Uh, let's see. Um, all right. This should be an easy one. Anyone who doesn't get this one gets an F in this class. <laughs> How did Arjuna get his perfection? Yeah. How was that proven? No, no, no. How, how is it proven in Bhagavad Gita? No, no, you got it. Yeah, anybody, is Krishna driving you to work? No, but look at Arjuna. 
Krishna is driving him to work. That means he's got a pretty nice relationship. Yes. And who surrendered everything? No. He did all nine. Who surrendered? Bali. What was the token of his full surrender? His head. All right, you came in. Very good, you got a point. Excellent. He offered his head. Very good. All right. Let's continue. A person is said to be elevated in yoga when having renounced all material desires, one neither acts for said gratification nor engages in fruitive activities. So that's how you know you're elevated in yoga. You have no more material desires. You don't act for sense gratification. You don't engage in fruitive activities because what is the result of fruitive activities? You enjoy better material facilities. That's the result of fruitive activities. You enjoy such as going to the heavenly planet. That's the result of fruitive activities. You join, you enjoy better in the future. That's what happens. You do penances and austerities, pujas, so that later on you get to go to the heavenly planets. All right, let's go to the next section. Okay, the next section is called Atma as the mind. And there's a reason why I called this section Atma as the mind because there are seven different definitions for the word Atma. This I got from Lord Chaitanya when he's instructing Sanatan Goswami. So here, I don't think I put it there, right? I didn't put it. Anyway, it's in my notes. So here are the different meanings of the word Atma. The first one, body. Yes, for some people, the self is the body. You know many of them, your next door neighbor, your boss, Donald Trump, right? He thinks he's the body. Okay, the next one, mana. What's mana? Mind. As I said, my eldest brother, he thinks that's the self, the mind. The next one, Brahma, the absolute truth, spirit, being. <coughs> Number four, Swabhav. What is Swabhav? Your nature. Very good. Next one, Dritti. Dritti means you're very firm, very determined. Yes, very good. All right, next one. Buddhishu, what is that? Yes, the sense of intelligence. Is the word Atma is sometimes used in that sense. And then the last one, Prayatne. F, ooh, my God. Jai. Very good. Endeavor or effort. So, that's why you need a spiritual master. Because you got to know which word applies in which context. And that's what the Mayavadis do. They juggle these things and come up with a completely different translation of Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures. Because they mix and match and they juggle and they do. No. So here, according to Prabhupada, Atma here in this section, although it could refer to seven things, it's referring to the mind. And the reason is, the mind is the central point in all yoga practices. Doesn't matter which yoga you're doing, the first order of business in any yoga, control the mind. What's Lord Chaitanya's first shikshastakam instruction? Which means cleans the mind or cleans the heart. Exactly. 
So even he begins his instructions with the mind. Okay. The Supreme Personality of God had said, one must deliver oneself with the help of one's mind and not degrade oneself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. For one who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, the one's mind will remain the greatest enemy. This was Ravan. Because all throughout, everyone was telling him, why are you so attached to Sita? You're losing everything. He lost all his sons, did he not? One after another he sent to defeat Ram and Lakshman, and one after another they died. All because he couldn't, his mind became his worst enemy. His mind couldn't give up that attachment to Sita. His, everyone, all his advisors warned him, look, we're going to lose everything. They knew it. They could see it. As the battle was progressing, his commanders, his ministers told him, you're going to lose everything. Just give up this attachment to Sita. Give her back to Ram. But no, he couldn't give up that attachment. When uh, who, who did Ravana send to act as the golden deer? He even told Ram, no, 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 don't do this. You, ha you don't know what you do, because Maricha had seen what had happened in the very beginning when Ram defeated so many Rakshasas single-handedly. And I think Maricha was shot and he was like kicked a tremendous distance, but he wasn't killed. He, Ram allowed him to escape. But he saw the prowess of Ram. So when Ravana came to him with his proposal, he goes, what are you, crazy? You're, you're, and, but Ravana couldn't care. He said, either you do it or I'll kill you. So Maricha thought, better to get killed by Ram. Then because if he gets killed by Ravana, what happens? Then he goes to hell. But if he gets killed by Ram, yeah, so he had a little in touch because he, he saw what Ram could do. So everyone was telling Ravana, give this up. It's just a woman. You, you've got so many women. For one woman, you're going to risk everything? That's the problem with lust. You lose everything. Everything you lose. And it all be... And so Ravana's mind was his own worst enemy. Let's continue. For one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached. For one has attained tranquility. To such a man, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor are all the same. How is that? How is that? Was that? Okay. So in other words, all these things are material considerations. When you're on the spiritual platform, you're not worried about material things. You could care less because you have spiritual vision. You have spiritual knowledge. But when you're attached, who said attached? Somebody said it, yeah. So, but when you're attached to the material world, these things become very important. But a devotee de learns detachment. A person is said to be established in self-realization and is called a yogi or mystic when one is fully satisfied by virtue of acquired knowledge and realization. Such a person is situated in transcendence and is self-controlled. 
One sees everything, whether it be pebbles, stones, or gold, as the same, because they are, because they're material. Exactly. A person is considered still further advanced when one regards honest well-wishers, affectionate benefactors, the neutral, mediators, the envious, friends and enemies, the pious and the sinners, all with an equal mind. A transcendentalist should always engage one's body, mind and self in relationship with the Supreme. So that's what it means to be a transcendentalist. Your body, your mind, the soul, only in relationship with God. That's what it means to be a devotee. Anything you're doing, either with the body, mind, you're only doing it in relationship to Krishna. In chapter 2, Krishna gave the example of the tortoise. The tortoise, when it's not needed, the limbs are retracted. So a devotee is the same way. If I can't engage certain senses serving Krishna, then nothing. But of all the senses for a devotee, one has to be always engaged in Krishna's service. Which one? No. The mind. The mind has to be always fixed on Krishna. So, how do you fix the mind on Krishna? Hearing and chanting. All right. But of all the senses, at least, and that's why, in the description of Ambarish, the first statement was, Savai Manak Krishna Padara Vindayo. First, fix your mind on Krishna. Now, how do you fix your mind on Krishna? You read Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, chant, worship the deity, but the idea is fix the mind. That's why when Prabhupada started the movement, right, there were no rules and regulations because Prabhupada understood. First, I have to get them attached to Krishna. So that's how Prabhupada started this movement, attracting them to Krishna. Once they're attracted, now you can start to introduce rules and regulations. But if day number one, Prabhupada said, okay, can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, and you got to do this. No. First you get them attracted to Krishna. Then, little by little, you introduce things. Parents are doing that too with your children. You're not telling your children, okay, you're six years old now, you got to chant 16 rounds. No, no parent is doing that, and no kid is doing that at six years old. No, but you get them attached to Krishna little by little. What, your daughter's doing 16 rounds? So am I right? Oh, thank you. I get a ding. All right. 